As we're about to begin our sermon, I'm going to say that there's not one text we're going to plant on. Uh, later on in the sermon, I might ask you to move to a couple places, but generally most of the text I'll have on the screen. So we're going to be bouncing around. If I were to ask you, what is humanity's biggest problem? What would you say? Yes, and I think there's even more foundational reason than that, uh, why that would be a big problem. But when we think about what the scriptures say about God, there is one word that keeps coming up again and again and again. And it's that God is holy. In Isaiah 6, there's this vision where Isaiah is uh, before the throne of God, and he sees these seraphim, and they're covering their eyes, and they're covering their feet, and they are just, uh, with their other wings, they're flapping, and they're just saying, holy, holy, holy. When we communicate in English, we often use like italics or uh, bold letters. Some of you guys will put everything in all caps, when we're trying to emphasize things. In Hebrew uh, literature, what they used to do is that they would repeat things. And when they say holy, 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 they are emphasizing that the one unique thing, the one thing you can say about God is that he is holy. What does that mean exactly? that God is holy. There's different ways that people speak about holiness, but the one that most people agree on is that holiness means to be set apart. It means to be set apart. But it not only means to be set apart, it also means to be set apart as better. Uh, R.C. Sproul in his great book, classic book, The Holiness of God, he said if we were to put this in you know, a modern way of saying it, uh, the best way to say it is that holiness means a cut above the rest. What do I mean by that? If we, if we had a, there's some restaurants I'm sure that you guys like, and there's a one that you guys probably keep going back to again and again, and the reason for that is because that restaurant is, to you, a cut above the rest. It's separate, it's distinct. You can think about that with our wardrobe. Maybe you got a suit that is better than the other ones or a dress that's better than the other ones. And it is a cut above the rest. God, he's not only unique, he's not only different, he's better. And he's unlike anything else in all of creation. Which, by the way, every comparison we try to make of something to the Trinity always fails because there is nothing like God in creation, there's nothing you can compare him to. When we talk about definitions, we can break it down even further. Uh, there's two things that we use in definitions. One is, a, is to say denote, and another is to connote. Uh, denote means uh, what the word means exactly. Connote means it's like what the word implies. It's things that come off the word, but it's not exactly what the word means. Holiness uh, denotes separateness, but it connotes purity and goodness and perfection. God is holy and good and perfect. And that is humanity's biggest problem. Because we are not. There's a technical term that uh, linguists sometimes use, it's called uh, semantic satiation. And it's this idea that we hear a certain word over and over and over again so much that it starts losing its meaning, it starts losing its impact. Well, and, and we just start uh, tuning it out and we just ignore that word. Well, uh, the word sinner has become that in many ways. The word sinner has become that. When we hear it, we've heard it so often, it just starts to have little impact. But we are sinners. And I know we like to sometimes think of ourselves as people who are sort of morally upright, but occasionally make mistakes, and our sins are just mistakes. But that's not what Scripture says about us. 
Scripture says that we are, by our nature, sinful creatures. We are, at our core, evil. Just as Jesus said, he says, he even calls evil one time, he said, how can you being, e if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children? We're evil. You don't have to teach a spider how to spin a web. You don't have to teach a dog how to bark because it's in his nature. And David said that I was sinful from birth in one of the Psalms. And that means you don't have to teach us how to sin. We are sinners. We are at our core ontologically sinful people. If I asked you, what's the difference between you or me and maybe the most evil person you can think of in history, what's the difference? Maybe you're thinking of Hitler, Stalin. What's the difference? I don't think anything. Now you may think that's extreme, but the only reason you and I don't do things, the sinful things that Hitler, Stalin, others have done, the only reason we don't is because God restrains us. He keeps us from doing things that we otherwise would have done. If there's anything that we do uh, that is not just full out, you know, we're not planning to murder people, we're not doing these kinds of things, it's because God is restraining us from doing it. One of the most uh, telling places in all of scripture is Genesis 6. And uh, it says that God looked down on mankind and he said that he saw that the thoughts and intention of man's heart is only evil continually. Only evil continually. That's all we do. That's all our intentions are. That's all our thoughts are if God leaves us to that. We are cut from the same cloth as the people in Genesis 6. There's no difference. And so when we think about that, that God is holy and that we are sinners by nature, what is the result of our relationship? It, there's two things. First, our sinfulness, it creates separation. Scripture says that God cannot tolerate sin or allow evil in his presence. And so we consistently see separation from God from uh, when, he comes to, when it comes to dealing with sinners. There's a separation. When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden where the presence of God was there, what happened? Uh, well, that was because they were sinful. They were kicked out of his presence. And when we see, go to Mount Sinai, even people he is redeeming, God, when the glory of God comes to the top of Mount Sinai, what did he say was going to happen to the people of Israel if they came near the mountain? They would die. And then later on in, in Exodus, we see that the glory of the Lord went from the top of Mount Sinai and it came into the tabernacle, uh, Exodus 40. And it's the same thing. He goes into the Holy of Holies. God's manifest presence is there. And the high priest is the only one that's allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. And that's only one day of, year, uh, one day of the year on Yom Kippur. There used to be a Jewish tradition that says, this is outside of scripture, but uh, I mean, they're saying as if it's history. And so there's Jewish tradition that when the high priest used to go into the Holy of Holies, they would tie a rope around him because often the high priest would drop dead and they would have to pull his body out of the Holy of Holies with a rope. When sinful men are in the presence of a holy God, one, we see it creates separation, but two, they also die. There is a separation. And because if we are not separated, we will die. We cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. The second thing, though, that 
our sinful nature uh, has in relation to God is that it, it means that God must punish sin. There's a legal element to this. We talk about God's holiness, but justice flows from his holiness, from his holy character. And because God is holy, uh, God must do what is right. He must punish sin. He must punish evil. And we know this is true by our own observation in the world. When you go to, uh, when we look out into the world, we know that even unbelievers, the very fact that a court system exists means that we believe in justice. We believe in doing what's right. We believe that evil must be punished, which is, by the way, what it means, one of the reasons it means that we are made in God's image because we love things like justice, something the animals don't care for or even think about. And we often, we use the sentence that a judge will give for somebody a crime that they committed. We'll use that sentence as a way to sort of judge the, the character of the judge. What do I mean by that? Well, hypothetically speaking, if we were standing in front, or if somebody was standing in front of a judge and they were convicted of murder, first degree murder, not that this would actually happen, but they're convicted of first degree murder, if the judge just let them off, we would think that judge is immoral. We would think that judge is himself or herself evil. On the flip side of that, if somebody is guilty of first degree murder and the judge throws the book at him, we can see that he cannot tolerate evil. We can see that he has a hatred of evil. And because God is holy, and because he loves what is good and he loves what is perfect and therefore hates evil, he has to oppose evil. And we are evil. God requires perfection. How many sins did it take for Adam and Eve to get kicked out of the garden? One. God judges sin. And even what we might consider to be some small mistakes is a great personal offense to God. In one of the Psalms, uh, David said, against you and you only have I sinned. When we read that, you might think, this is a cop-out, David, because he's probably talking about his sin with Bathsheba, and of course he sinned against Bathsheba, he sinned against Uriah, he sinned against many others. But what he's saying is that ultimately, this is a personal offense to you. When people sin, it's not just a sin against somebody else. God takes that as if you sinned against him. It's a personal offense against him. And he judges it. Acts says that God has appointed a day of judgment when he will judge the world in righteousness. And many people think uh, there's this idea that they're not very bad. They point to others who they think are worse than them. And they think that they're going to survive judgment day because, hey, they're better than this guy or that guy. But whenever we stand in the presence of a holy God, we finally understand who we really are. That temple vision I talked with Isaiah 6, when he was standing in the presence of God, what did he say? Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. When Jesus, uh, when Peter was in the presence of Jesus, he understood Jesus' perfection. He's seen it. He also understood about his sin. And what did he tell Jesus uh, after casting uh, a net into the sea and getting some fish? And Jesus saw, he saw Jesus' grace against, uh, to him. But he said, get away from me, for I am a sinner. Get away from me, for I am a sinful man. We see who we really are in the presence of a holy God. And many people, sadly, are going to be in for a rude awakening on Judgment Day. And as I said, he requires perfection, absolute perfection in our thoughts, in everything we do, in everything we say. Absolute perfection. And sadly, sadly, the sentence for anyone who is not perfect 
is an eternity of eternal conscious torment in hell. Now, when we think about eternity and and hell, we might think that's pretty drastic. Why such a harsh punishment? Why should people be punished forever for sins they only temporarily commit? But there are many reasons for that. One, God is eternal. We are going to live forever and our actions have eternal consequences. But also, we only like to apply the standard of time to God. We only apply that to God. Uh, Normally, crime, uh, time for a crime doesn't come into thought at all. Uh, If somebody takes five seconds to murder somebody, they could spend the rest of their life in prison or even forfeit their own life. Time doesn't matter. What comes uh, into play is the evil actions that we've done, just the evil act itself, not how long it took us to commit that act. So we have all fallen short of God's perfect standard of judgment, and we are all born having this sentence of condemnation upon us. We are all guilty and by nature subject to the wrath of God. And here's the sobering reality. We deserve it. We absolutely deserve it. And so what are we to do? We have no ability to save ourselves. Our default thinking is that if we just do some good things, uh, that's going to outweigh the evil that we've done. Punishment doesn't work like that. Good deeds don't erase bad deeds. If you have a a son and he hit your daughter and uh, you punished your son and he said, you shouldn't punish me because I took out the trash, you'd say that's completely irrelevant. You taking out the trash has nothing to do with what you did to your sister. Good deeds don't erase bad deeds. The most vivid And telling uh, description in scripture of who we are is in Ephesians 2, when Paul says, you were dead in your sins. You were dead in your sins. That's our spiritual state. What can a dead man do? Nothing. Nothing. Every man in their natural state, every woman in their natural state, is dead, and they cannot do the first thing to move themselves towards God. They're lifeless. They can do nothing to come to God. And because we are dead, Paul says that we are all, that we were all on our own without hope. Now, I know what you all are thinking. Well, we can't do anything, but God can. But even that has difficulties. Listen to Proverbs 17.5, and we'll get to scripture in a second. But Proverbs 17.5, he says, he makes clear that he who justifies the wicked is an abomination. He who justifies the wicked is an abomination. And if God were just to forgive you and me and sweep it under the rug, he would would be, by his own words, an abomination. If he just forgives us, he would, by his own words, be an abomination. If there's any hope for us to be redeemed, if there's any hope for us to be forgiven, it has to be in a way that will not compromise the justice of God. We talked about how justice flows out of the holiness of God. There's another attribute that flows out of God's holiness. Love. I said that God's holiness is man's greatest problem, but it's also man's greatest hope. And that's because justice isn't the only thing flowing from God. It's love. I'm going to play the first slide. You guys uh, remember that I said that scripture teaches he who justifies the wicked is an abomination, but look at Romans 4 verse 5. Well, that's the first verse. Uh, He who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. 
Now look at Romans 4, verse 5. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. That's the phrase I want you to see. The God who justifies the ungodly. How does that work? How can God justify the ungodly without being wicked himself? We talked about justification recently, and it has two parts to it. There's a positive part, uh, there's a part where there's a positive righteousness, and there's a part where there is a negative component where uh, sins are covered, sins are hidden, sins are forgiven. Uh, the positive part is uh, if we just had only, if we didn't have the positive part, we would be sort of neutral like Adam in the garden before he'd done anything good or bad. So there's that positive part, but there's also a negative part. And the negative part, how sins are forgiven, is what we're going to talk about the rest of today's sermon. How are sins covered? How are they considered as if we didn't do them? How are we forgiven? for the sinful deeds that are, that we have accrued, the debt that we've accrued from our sinful deeds. The Bible uses one word to describe how our problem with God is handled, and it should be the sweetest word you've ever heard in your life. Propitiation. Propitiation. Now, that might seem kind of anticlimactic when I just said it. What is propi uh, propitiation? It means to turn away or avert wrath. God has a just wrath against us, and propitiation teaches that the wrath is turned away from us. It is removed. It is absorbed. It is deflected. Uh, you can turn to Romans 3. We're going to plant there for a second, but I also have a slide for you. Give you a second. I hear a couple pages turning. I want to affirm that everything in Scripture is important, highly important. But I believe Romans 3:21 to 28 are the most important words that have ever been written. I'm going to read verses 22 to 25 and look out for the word propitiation. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. I've spent the first part of this sermon laboring that everybody is condemned, everybody is fallen short of God's perfect standard, and that's exactly what Paul does in verses Roman, uh, in Romans 1 to 3, in chapters 1 to 3. He is saying that all people, everyone everywhere, has fallen short of God's standard and are under his wrath and condemned. But then he goes here. In verse 23, he summarizes, that, he summarizes what I just said, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he goes on to say that we are justified by his grace as a gift. In other words, it's been painfully obvious since the garden, looking at Israel, looking at everyone else, that no one on their own can be perfectly righteous before God. It cannot happen. And so Paul is saying, God is saying, we're going to do this by grace. I'm going to give you, I'm going to forgive you of your sins and give you the status of righteousness as a gift. Something you cannot earn. And we get a hint of how it comes. Uh, and, and we see, uh, sorry, look at how the gift comes. And, and uh, it says, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's how the gift comes. This was costly for God. It was free for us, but it's costly for God. It comes through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to give us a hint of how it came through Jesus. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. There's that word. 
propitiation. We are considered innocent, acquitted because of Jesus' sacrificial death, which is a propitiation, which turns away wrath. We have the free gift of being not guilty, of having that not guilty verdict in God's courtroom because Jesus absorbed God's wrath by offering up his life. It says at the end of verse 25, to be received by faith. We, we talked about justification by faith alone for two weeks. And I want to say that our faith is not the basis for our justification. It's not the reason we're justified. The reason we're justified is through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. That's the basis. Faith is the instrument that connects us to the work of Jesus. And if you guys want a very clear summary statement of what I'm teaching, if you're already in Romans, uh, chapter, look at chapter 5, verse 9. I don't know if I put that on a slide or not. Nope. Uh, it says, Since therefore, this is chapter 5, verse 9, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Justified by the blood. The blood of Jesus, it saves us from the wrath of God. The blood averts God's wrath, turns it away. Propitiation. But we can go a step further. And we can ask, how exactly does Jesus' death avert, avert God's wrath? How exactly does that happen? How does Jesus' death turn away God's wrath from you and me? Why does Jesus' death have any benefit for you and me? Here's another key word for you. Substitution. The Old Testament, it gives lots of hints uh, along the way uh, about how God will dwell with man again through substitution. Uh, we can think about uh, in uh, the situation with Abraham, what did Abraham want? He wanted a promised son. God promised him that Isaac would come. And then when Isaac came, what did God say to do? Go sacrifice him. And so you can imagine he's going uh, with all the turmoil, with all the uh, inner uh, emotion going through him. He's going and he brings Isaac and Isaac notices there's not a sacrifice. And he asks Abraham, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide a lamb. But he continues going, and right before he's about to sacrifice his own son, God provides a ram in the thicket. What we're seeing is a substitution in place of Isaac, God providing a sacrifice in place of Isaac. There's another component to that, too, when you think about it. As uh, Abraham is sitting here, thinking about having to sacrifice his son. You can think about how horrible that would have been in his head, how uh, all the emotion that would have been in him. But yet he didn't know that that's exactly what God was going to do. Sacrifice his own son. We also see in the Exodus that they had to have a spotless perfect and sacrificial lamb because God's wrath is about to come on them. And if they didn't have the blood of that lamb on the doorpost, then the firstborn son would be killed. So the wrath of God is about to come on them. But the lamb, when it says, when God, when I see the blood, I will pass over. That's wrath being averted. That's a propitiation, a substitute lamb in place of the wrath falling on them. The wrath falls, well, on the lamb, so to speak. One of the clearest places we see substitution is a sacrificial system, which um, many had a similar, uh, similar ritual. One in particular teaches us about propitiation by substitution. It's called the Day of Atonement, which is what George read earlier. And this is a very rich passage with symbolism. On the Day of Atonement, there are two goats, two animals, and one is sacrificed, and then the other, they place their hands on the goat, and this is symbolically transferring the sins of the people onto the goat, and then the goat is led away into the wilderness. 
Now, these two goats, the animal sacrifice and the goat leaving the wilderness, going to the wilderness, it's painting one picture. And it's the idea that through a substitutionary sacrifice, our sins are taken away. There's, there's other more explicit teachings. Obviously, they realized that the blood and bulls of goats don't take away sin. And so Isaiah, he saw in the future, in Isaiah 53, we won't go there, but he just saw that there needed to be a human sacrifice. Goats and animals, lambs, these weren't enough. Jesus is the reality and substance of all these soul, uh, Old Testament teachings. He is the reality and substance of all these Old Testament teachings. On the Day of Atonement, he's not only the sacrifice, he's also the high priest and the scapegoat. Jesus is also our true Passover lamb, as, as Paul says in Corinthians, that Jesus is our true Passover lamb. Peter says in the first chapter of his epistle that Jesus is a lamb without spot or blemish. He's perfect. Where's a place in the New Testament that you see substitution? In the Gospels, where do you see substitution? Well, right before Jesus is about to go to the cross, Pilate, he brings out two people. He brings out Barabbas and he brings out Jesus. And one of them is going to be condemned. And he asks the people, which one do you want? You want Barabbas or Jesus? We know Barabbas is guilty. Luke says he's a murderer. We know Jesus is innocent because Pilate said, what evil has he done? But the crowd chooses Barabbas. And what we are seeing there is substitution. Jesus dying in the place of Barabbas. The condemnation of the innocent and the guilty going free. The condemnation of the innocent and the guilty going free. The story, it, it stitches substitution in the gospel narrative. You can turn to 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, but I do have a slide also. Here's another place that teaches substitution. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Jesus' death was the righteous suffering in the place of the unrighteous so that we could be brought to God. We deserve to die. Jesus dies in our place. He is our substitute. How does he do that? He does it as Peter says, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. He took the penalty of our debt upon himself. Israelites, uh, in, the, in the Exodus, God told the, uh, the Israelites who were disobedient when they were in the wilderness that your children are going to be paying for your sins. The children are going to bear your iniquity. Sort of same thing. Jesus is bearing the penalty of our sins on the cross. Paul uh, explains this in Colossians put Colossians 2 on the screen. It says, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So he forgave us of our trespasses by canceling this legal record of debt against us. There is a legal component to this. We are legally condemned for sin. Our sin created a debt. It was a debt that was so great that we could never pay it. But what Paul is teaching here in Colossians 2, that everything we've ever done, every single sinful thing that we've ever done, every major sin, everything that you think is a minor sin, every wrong thought, every second of the day when we have failed to love God perfectly and failed to love people perfectly, 
He is saying that God put that debt onto Jesus, nailed it to the cross, and then he treated Jesus as if he was the criminal and poured out the entire weight of his wrath on Jesus. And that's why we're justified by faith alone. Because if Jesus paid it all, if Jesus paid for everything, what's left for us to do? What's left? The death of the Son of God is all we need. One pastor, he combined two hymns and said on judgment day, we say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, that he died for me. And that turns away wrath because legally speaking, we have never sinned. We have never sinned. Our sins are covered, hidden, atoned for. And now, because of that, God no longer no looks, on, uh, looks at us with wrath. If Jesus has died for you, the judicial wrath against you is completely gone. It's completely gone. We may think that He's angry with us for the sins that we're committing day by day. But if we're trusting and we can see Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins, Scripture says there is no more wrath for us in a judicial way. We are now in a family. There might be discipline, but there is no longer wrath. And one of the last questions is, how does the temporary suffering of Jesus absorb the wrath that billions of people would have had to suffer for eternity. Billions of people have to suffer for eternity. Jesus spends three hours and dies on a cross. How does that pay for humanity's sin? I read an article recently that was very helpful with this. And we have to keep, quit thinking of punishment solely in the terms of temporal time. We have to think of it more in a qualitative sense. What does that mean? It means that we have, to, we have a debt that has to get paid, and no matter how long it takes to pay that debt, it doesn't matter as long as the debt is paid. That's all that matters. The debt has to be paid. Uh, I'll give an illustration. If I uh, were to punish my eight-month-old daughter, and she were to be uh, eight months old for the rest of her life, and I said, Genesis, do the dishes, how long would it take her to do that? It'd never be done. But if I went and I started doing the dishes, it takes me 10 minutes, the debt is paid. The dishes are done. Something very similar is happening on the cross. We have this un we have this massive, huge debt that it takes us eternity to pay for. Not only that, we remain, we remain rebels even in eternity. It takes us eternity to pay for, but because of who Jesus is as the God-man, the human that stands in our place, and God who is worthy, this is the only person who can take that debt away. His death is worthy. It is valuable. It is priceless. As, Paul, as Peter said, we are not redeemed by gold and silver things that perish, but by the blood of Jesus. Before Jesus went to the cross, he had said, what did he say to the Father? He said, remove this cup from me. What was in that cup? We know from 
many Old Testament passages that it talks about God pouring his wrath in a cup and making the nations drink it, making unbelievers drink the cup of his wrath. And what Jesus was saying is he knew on the cross that he is going to have to drink the cup of God's wrath. As Spurgeon said, Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath to the dregs. He drank it to the dregs. And there's not a drop of, re- of wrath left for you and me to drink. Before I close, I've been teaching that we're forgiven by Uh, We're forgiven, we're justified by Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice. I want you to see it one last place. What's the opposite of justification? Condemnation. Condemnation. Paul is wanting to assure believers of their standing in Christ. And so listen to what he says in Romans 8. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. The idea is that when we feel guilty and Satan accuses us and our own consciences condemn us, the idea isn't to say, you're wrong about this. The idea is to agree. Yes, I did do all those things. Yes, I do deserve condemnation. But it's to respond, Christ Jesus is the one who died. And if Jesus died, I don't have to die. I can't die. If Jesus died, what's possibly left for me? There's no condemnation left for me. Jesus was condemned for us. And that means if God's justice is satisfied if he didn't just, that means he didn't just sweep it under the rug. That means God is just in punishing Jesus and forgiving us at the same time. It doesn't make him an abomination. It doesn't make him wicked because he did satisfy justice in Jesus. As he says, Paul says in Romans, God is the just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son to remove our guilt, to remove your wrath from us. Thank you that he is a propitiation. Thank you that he is our substitution. We pray, Father, that we would live as people under the cross, that we would live as people forgiven, and that we would know it, knowing that our enemy, his number one thing is to Make us feel shame and guilt over our sins so we don't come to God. We pray, Father, that we would plea and remind him of the cross. We pray that we would remind you of the cross and that we are trusting in it. We pray these things and we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen.